Good morning, and welcome to the Chesapeake Food Shed Network's Coffee Talk series, Learning and Connecting for Action. My name is Christy Gabbard, and I'm the owner of Local Concepts, a consulting firm which provides the development and coordination support for the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. I'm joining you today from southwest Virginia. It's kind of sunny out, a little bit cool, and, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm also joined by my Local Concepts team member, Jonas Tipos, who is leading our program development for the Chesapeake Food Shed Network, and she is participating from Maryland. Uh, so before jumping into this, this coffee talk, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. And the network is a group of organizations, businesses, funders, agency representatives, and other change agents who are working across the Chesapeake watershed to build a stronger and more resilient food system. We're a relatively new initiative. We've been um, at hard at work for the last year and a half. And the leadership group that spurred our development, that spurred the network's development, did so because they recognized that there's a great deal of extraordinary work being done to advance our regional food system but there really wasn't any entity intentionally trying to build connections, trust, and relationships among those out there doing the work. So our mission at the Chesapeake Food Shed Network is to catalyze connections and collaborations that help build a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable regional food system and the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We believe by catalyzing connections and collaborations that we are stronger together and we can help to accelerate change in our food system. This is a picture of our network building blocks. The foundation of our network is all about building connections, about getting to know one another, and sharing information and knowledge. <clears throat> we believe that as we build relationships and trust, that as we know one another better, we might over time see opportunities to align and to work collectively towards action. We invite anyone that supports our vision of a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable regional food system to participate in the Chesapeake Food Shed Network. So um, to get us started, I just wanted to give you a, a, a real brief overview of what the Coffee Talk platforms are, or the Coffee Talk, why we host these Coffee Talks. They are a platform that the network has developed to help catalyze connections around specific food system topics. The idea is to partner with a resource expert. So today we've partnered with the American Heart Association, and we're very excited about the information they're going to share with you. But we partner with a resource expert to provide a quick learning opportunity through the webinar. And then during the webinar and our follow-up materials, we will identify ways for you to continue to engage and dig in deeper around this food system topic. So we don't want these webinars to be kind of a one-off learning opportunity. Rather, we want them to be a starting point for engaging with others who are doing similar work. <clears throat> Today's Coffee Talk is an opportunity to raise awareness of innovative strategies and programs that the American Heart Association is leading for making healthy eating choices the, e the easy choice. So today, uh, we are joined by a great group of women from the American Heart Association. They are joining us from uh, Maryland and also from southeastern Virginia. And they will, again, as I said, will be sharing information on strategies and innovative programs that the American Heart Association has developed to help make the healthy choice the easy choice. Before I um, give you a, a proper presentation and share a little bit of background with you about each of our presenters, I do, I do want to cover a couple uh, housekeeping items. One is, if you have any questions, we will, Yona will be collecting those questions. You can submit them using the question feature in your GoToWebinar control panel. Yona will collect those throughout the presentation, so you can submit them at any time. And then after we hear from Danelle, Kimberly, and Michelle, we will uh, share those questions back to our presenters. 
So again, feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentations, and Yona will collect those. I also want to point out to you um, a couple of handouts available in the <clears throat> that you can access in the handout feature again in the GoToWebinar control panel. At the end of the presentation, well, in a couple of days after the a couple of days following this presentation, we will follow up with each one of the registrants with a recording of the webinar, the slide deck, as well as um, the uh, the handouts and any other links to uh, programs that are mentioned throughout the webinar. And again, we will follow up with information about how you can stay connected uh, with initiatives like the, the, these that are going to be presented today. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to introduce to you our speakers. Uh, we are we are jo going to hear from Danelle Buckman first, and she serves as the Senior Community Health Director for the American Heart Association Greater Maryland Region. As Community Health Director for the region, she works collaboratively across the health strategies team to achieve community health impacts. This includes implementing the community health plan, engaging partners in key American Heart Association activities, and aligning revenue and health strategies opportunities with the top employers in the region. So Danelle is going to present to you first, and then we'll hear from Kimberly Mays, who is the Senior Director for the Multicultural Health Initiative for the American Association Greater Maryland Region. In this role, Kimberly supports the health impact goals of the American Association, excuse me, the American Heart Association by focusing on policy, systems, and environmental change that target individuals and families in vulnerable populations, specifically multicultural communities. And then finally, we'll hear from Michelle Charters, who's joining us from the Tidewater area in Virginia. She comes from the Tidewater Community College, where she was the program coordinator for healthcare workforce. Michelle has experience in the areas of obesity, asthma, and coalition management, and participated in the Healthy by Default training in March at UCLA. Prior to becoming an instructor, she was the director of Project Immunize Virginia, a statewide immunization coalition working closely with the Virginia Department of Health. She has also facilitated, coordinated, and evaluated coalition activities that promote timely immunizations across the lifespan. <clears throat> Ms. Charter has 20 years experience in health and nonprofit organizations and has held management positions in program development and fundraising with the American Heart Association, the American Lung Association, and the National Kidney Foundation. So we have a wonderful group of presenters today. And um, with that, I will turn it over to you, Danelle. Thanks, Christy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're so excited to talk to you today all about the American Heart Association's nutrition work. We're doing this work all across the country. But today, we're so excited to specifically talk about two of the states that are part of the network, uh, the work that Kim and I are doing in Maryland and the great work that Michelle is doing in Panton Roads, Virginia. So I'm going to kick off the presentation, um, as Christy said, by talking a little bit about our worksite wellness efforts. And then I'm actually going to kick it over to Michelle, who will talk about our healthy food finance work in Hampton Roads, Virginia. And then Kim is going to, um, to end the presentation talking about the one and only Simple Cooking with Heart Kitchen in Baltimore. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> the American Heart Association believes that everyone deserves to live a healthier, longer life. Through our science-based knowledge, we empower people, communities, and organizations to build a sustainable culture of health. To support our health impact goal of helping all Americans improve their cardiovascular health, the American Heart Association encourages organizations and communities to create a healthy food and beverage environment. Together, we can create what we call a culture of health, an environment where the healthy choice is the default or the easy choice. And it's important because making healthy changes in the workplace is a place where people spend most of their day. So before we uh, move forward, we're going to do a quick poll just to kind of get an assessment of where people are now. I think Anna's is going to bring up the poll. And then we'll take a few seconds for everyone to answer it.
Jenna, do you need me to do anything to pull it up? No. So that okay. so we we just shared the results um, back. Oh, I'm and it was a hundred percent. I'm sorry, you didn't see that. A hundred percent of respondents okay. do not have an official healthy food and beverage policy okay. where they live, work, learn, play, and pray. So 100% no. Okay. okay. Back to the presentation. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Well, then, that's wonderful. So that gives us a lot to talk about today. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, um, maybe some of you can take some of this information back to your, your community organizations or your work sites or your schools and, and maybe um, you know, start to think about how you might be able to create some sort of policy um, where you can make uh, healthier choices available. So quickly, I'll just run through our objectives for today's presentation. We want to um, describe the Heart Association strategy for improving access by enhancing an organization's food and beverage environment. Uh, state why a policy systems and environmental approach is important in addition to our public health education. Identify the factors that influence food selection in the food environment, including price, product placement, and promotion. And then, of course, we're going to list um, some resources to improve the food and beverage environment, including uh, technical assistance that the Heart Association can provide. And we're also going to provide an overview of healthy food financing initiatives in Hampton Roads, as I mentioned. And it looks like number six got cut off, but that's when we're going to talk about our efforts at the Simple Cooking with Heart more. <clears throat> so this slide addresses exactly why is the American Heart Association interested in and healthy food and beverages in all in all settings. Um, our mission is uh, to build healthier lives free of cardiovascular disease and stroke. Our top priority is a health impact goal for the year 2020. We want to improve cardiovascular health for all Americans by 20% while reducing deaths from cardiovascular disease and stroke by 20%. And I'll tell you, up to this point, we've been doing a pretty good job reducing the, the mortality from heart disease. As, as most of you know, heart disease is the number one killer of, of Americans. And due to scientific um, advances, you know, with CPR and, you know, in our quality of care initiatives with hospital, um, advances in surgery and other medical procedures, that statistic is actually reducing. However, what we're really lagging behind is that other part of the goal, the 20% of improved health. And a big reason for that is because, unfortunately, Americans are they're not eating as well. Um, you see our Life Simple 7, those are the things that we encourage people to do to increase their improved health. And so today we're specifically going to talk about the healthy diet and healthy weight part of it. But at the very end of the presentation, we'll show you um, a few additional resources that you can go and check out some other programs that address uh, the other um, programs that we have. So this slide describes how we're going to help impact that 2020 goal to improve uh, cardiovascular health of all Americans by increasing access to healthy food and beverage. And that's really what Kim, Michelle, and I wanted to focus on today was around healthy food access and the different ways that we could go about that. So you can see um, the first thing that we want to do um, in increasing healthy access is to improve the quality, the pricing, the policy, and the availability of a healthy national food chain. Um, there's a couple different ways and a couple different strategies that we can do that, um, but, but primarily we want to increase accessibility of fruits and vegetables. Um, another tactic is to increase the pricing of sugary beverages, thus bringing down the um, demand and supply. And of course we have our, um, our sodium initiatives as well. We really want to improve access to healthy foods everywhere we go, in all settings, in schools and early child care um, settings, we uh, get involved with advocacy efforts, of course, the child nutrition re reauthorization. We um, address food marketing to kids. Um, the second part here is what we're going to talk about in a few slides in work sites, safe based and communities, by encouraging these settings to offer healthier food and beverage options, either in on-site meetings and their vending machines. Um, and then finally, uh, which Michelle's going to talk about, is we try to address the food desert and uh, low-income areas and addressing the fact that uh, many of them do not have access to grocery stores um, and they certainly don't have access to local fresh food. So what are some things that we can do to help increase access in that area as well? And one of the things that the American Heart Association uh, really started to think about um, in the last couple of years is, of course, we've always had our public education efforts. 
you know, we, we educate people on, on why nutrition is important and why maintaining a healthy weight is important. And, you know, we share healthy recipes and, and things like that. But at some point, we really want to push beyond that public health, um, um, the public health work. And we really want to make what we call a policy systems or environmental change. And the reason we want to do that is because it creates a more sustainable change. So again, it's a strategy that's going beyond these, these traditional methods to actually change the environment to really support people and their desires to improve their health by better nutrition. And a recent study showed that improving the types of foods and beverages served and sold in the workplace positively affects employees' eating behaviors and results in a net weight loss. Uh, there's a statistic I read recently that at any given time, more than 50% of Americans are trying to eat better. So whether they're on an official diet or they're just trying to eat healthier. And we want workplaces and other community settings to really support that effort and make it easier for people to make the healthy choice and to really make the healthy choice to be the default choice. And of course, from a business standpoint, we know that maintaining a healthier workforce can lower direct costs such as insurance premiums. It can also positively affect many indirect costs, such as absenteeism and worker productivity. So what are we talking about when we're talking about a policy systems or environmental change? Um, it's kind of a mouthful, and it took me a little while to actually um, you know, get a handle. What, what does this mean exactly? Um, so a lot of times we refer to a policy as a big P or a little p policy. Um, so we're talking about policies. It could be an ordinance, a law, a regulatory change. Basically, it could be some sort of rule at the legislative level. Or it can be what we call a little p policy, an organizational policy, which is a written policy that can be applicable to a specific company or organization. And written, written policies are more likely to weather changes in organizational leadership or priorities compared to an informal policy. So in other words, maybe somebody decides that um, you know, a leadership decides they want to make some changes in their food environment at work, and then a new leadership comes in and decides they want to change it. But you have something in writing, it facilitates consistent implementation. Having a written policy can also promote education and awareness, and make it easier to incorporate the policy into RFPs or vendor contracts. A system change um, are those strategies that impact elements of the system. For example, uh, in the spending machine example here, um, you could work with vendors to change the product mix provided to the company. So if you have a vendor that um, you work in an office building and there's, say, three or four vending machines that are being serviced, if you work with the vendor, you are not only affecting just the one machine, you're affecting the entire system. And finally, environment. And these are strategies that involve the physical environment. So again, I talked about healthy vending machines. Um, you may have education resources provided at the point of purchase to encourage individuals to make the healthy choice. I've seen recently um, a lot of times a vendor will put like a little heart or a little apple to show uh, the consumer very easily what um, the healthy choices are. So the American Heart Association has a lot of really great resources that are available to everyone um, to help address changing uh, the food environment at work. We do the healthy workplace, and we also have the healthy community version of this. And basically, it walks through uh, the things that a setting, so a company or a church or a school, um, that what you need to uh, consider when you're making improvements. So um, it addresses on and off-site meetings. It addresses vending machines, if you happen to have vending machines in those areas, and also um, office snacks in common locations. And it really provides step-by-step -step guidance. Um, it can be adopted by any size organization. I think that's really important. A lot of times um, we hear, well, in our office, we don't even have a vending machine. But it addresses all sorts of foods. So perhaps you're in an office that's small, but you um, order out for a lunch meeting every now and then, or you host a conference, and you want some guidance on how you can offer healthier food to your participants at the conference or a meeting. It's got sample menus, tools, all kinds of great things. And we'll um, show you a link to where you can actually get the, the toolkit. And we definitely encourage you to reach out to me um, or to Kim or Michelle, and we can certainly um, you know, provide some additional resources for you. One of the first things I just wanted to touch on this very briefly um, a lot of times when we're talking to companies or uh, houses of worship and they're interested in this, 
one of the very first things you want to do is talk to your employees, talk to the, the people that are um, that you know are in the setting that you wish to change, and just find out exactly what your current environment is. Um, do you have vending machines? Um, are you working with a vendor who'd be willing to actually work with you to provide healthier options? So basically, just get a good assessment of your environment. And the four things that we encourage people to look at when they're um, considering making changes are changing these four P's. Um, price. You want to price the products at a level where the nutritional options are more affordable. So in other words, you want to make sure that the water um, is more affordable than, say, um, a, a sugary beverage. You can look at the different types of products that you're offering. You can look at where, how you're placing them. You want to make sure that the healthier options are at eye level, that they're um, easily accessible. And finally, you can use um, different promotional uh, methods. You can use signs. You can use shelf tags. I mentioned earlier, I've seen in vending machines, they have like a little apple or a heart so that when somebody's coming to make a choice, they can very easily pick the healthier choice. There's so many benefits to doing <clears throat> As we started the, the presentation, it helps build the culture of health, where again, we're making the healthy choice, the easy choice, or the default choice. More often than not, if somebody is given um, a healthier option, they're, they're going to choose it. It's about making it the easy choice. It's increasing the number of healthy options. When we're talking about vending machines, they're not necessarily talking about taking away all of the, um, the sugary goodies. We're talking about increasing the healthier options to, again, support people and to making those healthier choices. We also can use um, these sustainable changes to educate employees about healthier cho choices and healthier eating patterns over time. And eventually, we really hope that this helps drive demand for healthier choices from vendors so that all across the state, all across the country, that vendors are starting to see that customers really do want healthier choices. And finally, um, one of the things that if you do decide you're setting um, either your school or your work site is really interested in offering healthier options for your employees, we do have a sample policy so that you can either make that organizational policy, as I mentioned earlier, from your leadership team, or you can actually work with your vendor as part of an RFP or a contracting process, and we can provide a sample policy that really lays out exactly what the American Heart Association recommends for healthier options. And you can then say that your um, company is adhering to American Heart Association guidelines around healthier food and beverage. So I'll close out my portion of the, uh, of the presentation by just showing you a few additional resources. And I, I believe these links went out already with um, the advertisement for the webinar. And of course, um, in the follow-up, we'll also include these links and definitely encourage you to check them out and to reach out to me if you have any additional questions. So with that, I am going to um, pass it off to my colleague, Michelle Charters, and she is working on the ANCA project, which she'll describe exactly what, what that acronym means, and the Hampton Roads, Virginia area around healthy food financing. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michelle. Thanks, Danelle. I'm really excited to be here with you this morning, and I hope through some of the examples that I'm giving, uh, it sparks some ideas that you could do in your own organization or city or area that you're working in because it's all about sharing. So I am funded through some uh, a grant money, and it's called Anchor. That's an internal name, not one that's recognized by the CDC. That title is way too long to uh, share with you. But ANCHOR st stands for Accelerating National Community Health Outcomes Through Reinforcing Partnerships. So it is all about working with others. Um, and it really is addressing, it falls under the chronic disease prevention umbrella. And there are other organizations. Um, SOFI, the Society for Public Health Educators, and DPHE, they all offer um, different portions of this grant. Some are training, some are looking at healthy choices for WIC consumers, but we're all working together to prevent <clears throat> chronic disease. And again, working through policy systems and environmental change. So that is really happening uh, on a collaborative level. And then we have 15 sites that are 
working on this um, in the United States, looking at specifically tobacco use, poor nutrition, and physical inactivity, and uh, trying to change those. So specifically, Anchor in Hampton Roads is looking at improving access to healthy, affordable food in low-income, low-access areas. So that's your typically what you typically know as food deserts. And the idea is that we want to remove the barrier to eating better. You can educate people all you want, but if they don't have access to it, if they can't find it or can't afford it, then the education um, is really of no use. So we've got to improve access before you can expect people to make a behavior change. And the strategies we're using are healthy food finance initiatives, fondly known as HFFI, and increasing the acceptance of SNAP EBT at farmers markets. Those are our two strategies in Hampton Roads. So what is healthy food financing? It's a mouthful, and when I talk to people, I don't often use that acronym because, again, that's sort of public health speak. But what it is is a combination of public and private funds, and it requires a minimal investment from the government. And typically, um, there's an investment from the government. It goes to an agency that serves as a fiscal agent, and then they can leverage this initial amount to grow the fund and provide uh, low-income loans to underserved areas and to really support their economic development. So that's kind of the technical behind-the-scenes work. Um, it provides the necessary support to local businesses to open grocery stores, food markets, mobile markets, and corner stores in underserved area. Again, removing the barrier to healthy access. In Virginia, we're really looking at um, increasing the number of grocery stores. In Hampton Roads, in my area, we're really looking at um, trying to get some mobile markets to underserved areas because building a grocery store really isn't something I can personally do. And then just to broaden it a little bit, North Carolina has some initiatives looking at healthy corner stores and trying to improve the look and the price of healthy offerings in the small you know, corner stores, bodegas, whatever's in the, the town already. So in Virginia, we talk about the big P issue, so that's, you know, the government issue. Our advocacy group is working to include uh, money in the budget uh, at the General Assembly level. Um, the campaign name this past year was called Closer to My Grocer, and it was initially put in the governor's budget, $10 million, and that stayed in there for a long time until it was uh, the budget was gone through by the House and the Senate, and then it, it got taken out. So the name of the fund was called Virginia's Grocery Investment Fund, and we'll be looking to push this issue for the next uh, General Assembly. And the grant work in Hampton Roads, since I really can't work in sort of the big P area, I'm really working in the small P, but I'm also doing a lot of ground softening. So I'm raising awareness that not everybody has access to healthy food um, and that raising that awareness and, and making sure that people understand everyone should have access um, is what I'm doing through a campaign called, and our campaign name is called Healthy Food VA. So I want to show you some examples. We have bus signs and billboards and websites, and um, these are just a few examples, but we try to use the same look and making the healthy choice the easy choice for her, sort of appealing to a parent perspective, and then it's driving people um, to our website as well as the hashtags. And Danelle, can you click on the website? I don't know if that's going to come up just so you can see. It's very simple. It's just a page on one of the Heart Association's um, websites. And they're, the overall, we decided to combine state-wise. And if you can click on the Hampton Roads up at the top, you see here's the closer to my grocer, and then there's the Hampton or Healthy Food Hampton Roads. I don't know if it's going to switch, but you can just kind of get an idea. There's some hyperlinks in here. Um, I'll be changing this up. You can click and see if your area has a food desert. So again, it was a very simple piece, and um, 
you know, you can go up there and look for other activities and resources too. But that's where we try to drive our our people to get active. There's you're the cure on there too, which is our you can sign up to be an advocate for the for this issue. So the next option is, uh, next strategy I'm working on is farmers markets. And the goal is to increase the acceptance of SNAP uh, EBTF farmers markets. As we really started to look at this, we realized that there are a lot of challenges in our area. And in the Hampton Roads area, there really aren't many farmers markets, specifically in the cities that I am working in. Uh, in total, there were only three. There were two in Norfolk, one in Portsmouth, and none in Hampton. And only one of those currently accepts SNAP EBT. Um, if any of you work with farmers markets and about the SNAP EBT acceptance and, and how it rolls out, it's pretty complicated. Um, it does provide a new revenue stream for farmers markets, but um, you have to be dedicated and have some staff to do that. Um, in our area, there are no nutrition incentive programs. Those are from the USDA. They're a FEMI grant, if you've heard of that. Sometimes they're also known as double greens or double bucks programs. And for example, Williamsburg does have one, one of the highest uh, matching programs in the country. So what that means is if someone were to come there and use their SNAP EBT, they'd get a matching program. So for up to $30 that they spent their SNAP EBT, $30, they get $30 in additional produce with a total of $60 with, worth of produce. So that's a lot of produce. Um, so that's exciting, and we certainly work with them to follow their successes. And the other piece in our area is, it's a, in, in probably in many areas, it's a very competitive environment among farmers markets, a little bit like herding cats. They're not always willing to share and learn from one another. So we're trying to change the culture of that and, and look at the benefits of sharing and, and gathering together. So we have a small poll. I'd just like to hear a little bit from you. Quick poll. It says, do the farmers markets that accept SNAP and EBT in your area, do they offer incentives like what I talked about, the double bucks or the matching program? Wow, well that's great. 80% have some of that double bucks and 20% um, don't know, but that's, uh, that's a wonderful thing. I, I'm a little bit jealous that you have that and we're working on private funds to offer sort of a double bucks program in our area since we didn't get a Feeney grant or one from Wholesome Wave. So here are our solutions with the farmer's market. We kind of had to back up and look at uh, supporting structures. So we decided to work with the Virginia Department of Agriculture Consumer Services, VDAX, and specifically the Virginia Grown Program, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And they're, they've been working with us to help spread the word about this anchor grant and know that I can help support their work. Um, we are also looking at a formation of a regional farmer's market association to discuss share information, sort of like what the Coffee Talks or the Chesapeake Food Shed is, the goals are, to really get people to talk and share and encourage each other with the SNAP acceptance specifically. Um, we are going to host the, mo the state mobile lab that is available to come and sign up farmers and farmers markets and train them on the SNAP EBT. So that looks to happen in the spring here in our area. And I also participate in um, a specific task force that looks at Virginia nutrition incentive programs. Um, it's part of the VAFMA organization, which is the Farm Market Association in Virginia. And Wholesome Wave is helping to um, get the structure going and look at different ways to incentivize not only a SNAP, but maybe seniors or military look at different markets that could use a little bit of incentive to get them shopping at farmers markets. Um, also, as part of that, and look at you know, kind of referring back to the SNAP, um, they are looking at doing a marketing campaign, sort of at a state level, for those that accept SNAP. So again, getting people to to really 
um, sign on, sort of an incentive that you get more marketing. So in Hampton Roads, this is, you know, some of the things we're doing, not all the things. Um, as you saw, we have the website hashtags. We were lucky enough to do a series of TV stories with WVEC, and he did um, the first story we pitched was one where you go shopping in a food desert uh, for your Thanksgiving meal and try to select healthy things, and of course that wasn't very successful. So um, that TV anchor went on to do a series of stories and really um, shed the light on healthy food access in our area. We've done letters to the editors and newspaper ads, um, of course the bus signs and billboards campaign. Um, we're doing a little bit of storytelling. We're getting some individuals to talk about what lack of access means to them and how it's affected their life. And we've also did a very, you know, low budget uh, grocery bag challenge video. Uh, what that meant was that we were at the Heart Walk and we asked people to carry one bag of groceries for a mile to simulate living in a food desert and what that might be like and then ask them how that felt and what if you had a disability or what if it was 100 degrees or you had to carry a gallon of milk and go up you know three flights of stairs and uh, talk to people about that and, and that was very successful um, that when you get the slide deck this particular word here is hyperlinked directly to the video but we can also send you the link separately if that doesn't work and we're also doing some community gardens promotion and container gardening specifically aimed at encouraging WIC and SNAP clients to try a little bit of gardening as a way to get uh, food access. Um, we're also doing, which I didn't put on the slide, trying to supply a healthy food box at a local clinic uh, targeting uh, those people with prediabetes, kind of looking at a prescription for produce model a little differently, but uh, that's slow moving and that one's in progress as well. So lastly, um, other things, I'm moving into three more cities as we move into what we call Cohort 2, and we're trying to bring a mobile market to uh, with local food to a community complex in a low-income, low-access area, as well as go to a low-income senior complex to see if we can improve access for healthy, affordable food. We're looking at vouchers. Again, we don't have the Double Bucks program, but we're trying to figure out a way to fund that that and to use at the mobile market and WIC recipients. What we're doing there, WIC is, is very different, but if they could just show their card, their WIC card, they might get a $5 voucher to use at the mobile market. And we're also working with um, a program that's out in sort of a more rural area and it's called Farm to Child Care and they are providing, um, trying to reduce obesity and increase the access to healthy foods by training child care providers in what's healthy and how do you um, bring in local foods to daycare centers and home-based child care. So we're looking at how can we supply the parents, the low-income parents, with produce. Um, and so we're looking at working with a local farmer or a CSA type of uh, produce option where they can pre-order and come in and pick up their fresh local food. So if you have any other questions, uh, you know how to get a hold of me. I am starting a mailing list with an e-newsletter just to connect, so I'd be happy to add you if you just want to uh, monitor. And that's it for me, so I'm going to introduce you to Kimberly Mays, and she is the Senior Director of Multicultural Health Initiatives in the Greater Maryland Region, and she's going to talk to you about Simple Cooking with Heart. Thanks so much. Thanks, Michelle. Um, hi, everyone. And Danelle and Michelle have been talking a bit about increasing access to healthy foods. And what we realized is that um, increasing access is a wonderful thing, but if you don't provide people with the know-how to cook that food, um, you're missing a big piece of the puzzle. So according to the CDC, more than one-third of Americans are considered obese. And being obese is one of the main risk factors of cardiovascular disease. But it can be controlled by simply changing your lifestyle. And that is really the, the mission of the Simple Cooking with Heart Kitchen. So
So our goal at the Simple Cooking with Heart Kitchen is to equip families with the necessary skills, tools, and resources to prevent obesity and then to improve the overall health of um, all Americans. In Baltimore, there were a lot of things taking place around food access, and it was a, a, an opportune time for us to explore bringing a, um, a tool like the kitchen um, into our area. So the kitchen is housed in East Baltimore um, in um, the largest uh, teaching kitchen at the Stratford University Culinary School. Um, so we outfitted one of the rooms to make it look like a home kitchen. We've got home style appliances um, and just a really warm atmosphere. We have free parking available, which is a commodity in the city. Um, and it's also accessible by our major um, transit systems. So we tried to make it as easy as possible for our target audience to, um, to come to the kitchen and take classes. Um, the kitchen is led by our kitchen manager, Chef Tia Berry. She is a graduate of Stratford Culinary School and actually started off as a volunteer for the American Heart Association before joining us full time. And what we really found is that the success of the kitchen is really, um, really depends upon the strength of your team. And we just have a really wonderful asset in Chef Tia. Um, she is able to talk to folks and, and she understands sort of how difficult it is to change your lifestyle, specifically around food behaviors. Um, and she really meets people where they are, and I think that's had a lot to do with the success of, of the kitchen to date. So our kitchen curriculum is a 10-class curriculum, and that is based off of the model um, set by Jamie Oliver in the UK. Um, each class has various components, um, cooking skills, of course. We also talk about nutrition objectives, um, recipes, and budget tips, um, and also ways to involve um, kids in sort of cooking activities. Each participant um, receives the raw ingredients for the meal that's to be prepared for that day, and then they cook it up, and it's enough for four, and they can take it home and involve their families because as most of us understand, it's really difficult to change your behavior if everyone around you um, is not on that same journey. So we really did want to make this something that uh, folks could share with their entire family. Um, our classes are $5, so it's very cost effective um, for the participants. And when they go home with the food, we also give them all of the lessons for that recipe uh, for that day so that they're taking that home with them as well. This is an outline of the 10 classes. Um, what we tried to do when we designed the curriculum was sort of really understand how many um, recipes um, one would need to begin to feel comfortable cooking more regularly at home. Um, and, and when you think about sort of your cooking sort of behaviors, I probably don't have 10 go-to recipes. I probably have more like five that I just tweak here and there. So 10 was really being very, very um, aggressive, but we, again, we wanted to give folks as many tools as possible um, so that they felt like they had enough knowledge um, that they could continue the home cooking behavior long after they had taken our classes. Um, and we also, in this um, preparation of the, of the curriculum, tried to consider the different cooking styles that we wanted folks to be aware of um, so that they could substitute any of, I'll say, bad behaviors that they may have had, such as frying, with some other techniques. So the impact of the kitchen, we really were focused on increasing cooking confidence and also um, increasing folks' enjoyment um, in cooking meals at home. We wanted to increase um, the public's awareness of the health benefits of home-prepared meals so we know you consume a lot less sodium, a lot less fat when you cook meals at home as opposed to eating out um, or um, purchasing carry-out meals. Um, we also wanted to increase the frequency with which folks um, prepared meals at home. Um, and we wanted them to include a wider, wider variety of food types when they were cooking. Um, 
Overall, we want that to lead to improved healthy diet scores for the participants in our classes. Um, and we want their attitudes towards consuming healthier foods to change. And we believe we are achieving this. Um, some, of the, some of the preliminary uh, analysis that we've seen has shown both an increase in confidence and an increase in communicating that they are more likely to continue uh, cooking at home. So um, in our short two years, we've held more than 3,000 um, classes in the kitchen, and, um, and folks have really taken to sort of having this tool um, available to them, and, and we've just been really, really pleased with the successes thus far and hope to continue um, in the future. So this is a clip of the kitchen featured on the Today Show when they sort of spotlighted Baltimore and all of the different things that were taking place in the city to improve um, the overall health of uh, Baltimoreans. Um, and we're going to share this link out so that everyone can see, but it's a really nice overview of the kitchen and it talks a little bit with some of our participants about sort of their struggles and what the kitchen has done to help them sort of change some of their um, behaviors as it relates to food. Um, if anyone is interested in connecting with us, uh, we do have a Facebook page. We also have a website um, from which you can view our class schedule. Um, and um, we try to, to post um, photos and videos on our Facebook page so people can get a real understanding of what's taking place in the kitchen and to see how much fun we have there every day. Lastly, um, we have just released a continuing education um, module um, for folks who are interested in sort of understanding um, what we've learned through our Simple Cooking with Heart program as far as what it takes to get folks on board with changing their behavior as it relates to preparing food at home. Um, and so this is available for free. Um, we look to roll out additional continuing education courses as well, um, but we wanted to share this out in case anyone was interested or knew of anyone um, interested in taking the course. And then lastly, um, we just wanted to sort of highlight all of the various healthy living programs that the American Heart Association has, again, um, working towards creating a culture of health where the, easy cho the healthy choice is the easy or the default choice. So we talked a little bit about the Simple Cooking with Heart program. We also have My Life Check, um, which is a system that allows you to um, sort of ascertain your healthy diet score and understand what you need to, um, the changes that you need to make to improve it. You're the Cure, as Michelle mentioned, is our um, government relations arm, our advocacy arm, where people can get involved in sort of the local policies um, that we are working on. Um, Go Red for Women is our very, very um, um, powerful um, initiative designed to increase women's awareness of heart disease. Um, Power to End Stroke is a program focused on African Americans and their risk of stroke. Um, so there's just a, a breadth of programs that we have available, and if folks are interested in learning more about it, they can certainly visit our website, heart.org forward slash healthy living for more information. Thank you so much to all of the presenters. Um, this was uh, such a rich breadth of programs and experiences shared, and we have a few questions that I'll um, share back with the presenters now. If you do have additional questions, please type them in now into the question box, and we'll try to get through all of them. Uh, this first question is from Hallie Sablowski, and it's from, and it's for uh, Michelle. Uh, Danelle and Kim may want to jump in as well if, if you have what to add. The question is, is the food desert tool only for Virginia or for neighboring areas as well? I'll um, take that, Yana, and it's it, really what you can do. Um, the one on our website is a link to the USDA 
a food desert map. So all you need to do is uh, Google USDA food deserts and you can put in um, your zip code or your city. You can, you can structure it how you want and that is certainly available um, for any state uh, in the U.S. It may be it's beyond that, but right now I know it is at least in the United States. So feel free to do that. It gives you some really good information. And it's easy to print out that information and share it uh, with your volunteers or your colleagues. Thank you, Michelle. And actually, just a follow-up question for that around food deserts. Within food deserts, how do you make sure that the quality of food is good, especially within new grocers? That is a, a tricky question because sometimes what people will do is just put, you know, a basket of brown bananas that cost $4 each on their, you know, near their checkout and call it healthy food access. So what we want to do is make sure that, um, you know, there's some inventory done that we have a group of people that can kind of pop in. I don't want to say secret shoppers, but we can go in and monitor and really work with them from the beginning. For example, um, there is a brand new grocery store going into a very underserved area in Newport News, and it's a local grocery store. Um, as many of you know, many of the chains really look at going where they can make money because they are a business. So we tend to work with local grocery stores and it's going to be called Jim's Local Market. And he is going to have a full service um, grocery store, but he's really engaged the community, including a lot of organizations um, that are going to offer, you know, cooking classes, uh, food, healthy food store tours. There's a credit union there um, that will help stretch the dollars because what, ha what tends to happen is all those SNAP EBT dollars get used up in the first two weeks and then there's no money for the rest of the month. So it does take monitoring and working with the store owner from the beginning to make sure that it's not substandard food, that it's packaged um, attractively and promoted. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, sure. This is a question now for Kim. Um, is this uh, the teaching kitchen that you described? Is this for people who want to learn to cook healthfully for their families? And does it also double as a commercial kitchen space? That's another question from Howie. So it is indeed um, a kitchen designed to bring people in to teach them how to cook healthy foods. Um, whether you have some cooking skill already um, and are just looking uh, to understand sort of healthier techniques to use, or whether you have a very limited cooking skill, um, we want all, all folks um, to feel free to attend the classes. It is not um, a commercial cooking space. So we conduct classes there only, but we do not prepare food for other purposes within the kitchen. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question from Elizabeth G. Mandoma, and she asks, are any of you working with any Virginia Cooperative Extension Service on food deserts? So back to food deserts, a lot of interest here. Uh, yes, we are working with all the uh, Virginia Cooperative Extensions. They've done, you know, quite a bit of uh, research on this and have created a video on food deserts in Virginia. But there is some special funding that's available. I'm not sure if that's just in Virginia. You may want to explore that if you have an interest in food deserts. But there are special agents who are working with SNAP EBT and they're often registered dietitians. Um, they're employed at the Virginia Extension Service, and they can come and help and do cooking demonstrations. Um, they're really out there to uh, service the existing organization. So yeah, I think the Virginia uh, Cooperative Extension is a great resource. Wonderful, thank you. And we have a question for Danelle about the toolkit. Um, and this might be the last question, or we might have time for one more. Danelle, um, how do you propose initiating discussion about bringing the toolkit into the workplace, especially if you encounter resistance? Well, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, the best place to start is with your champion. So if you're, you know, um, asking this question, my assumption is you're interested in bringing it to your workplace. Um, so you, it's a great place to start is you, you are the champion. 
and perhaps you have some other members of your office that are also really interested in this. Perhaps you have a personal story, or you're on a weight loss journey yourself, or um, some of your co coworkers are. Um, you know, really, the most important thing in having some sort of policy at, at work is obviously having a leadership buy-in. Um, and sure, um, we certainly hear uh, stories of, of people that are resistant to this. A lot of times people are concerned that, uh, particularly with the vending machines, that there'll be some um, uh, loss of income. You know, a lot of times um, you know, the vendors themselves will say, well, you know, that the healthier items won't, won't sell. Um, and so really, uh, you know, my, my two pieces of advice with this. One, you know, collect a few champions, um, really make your case, certainly, you know, bring in the American Heart Association to actually meet with your leadership team if, you, if you'd like. Um, you know, Ken and I have been on lots of those, lots of those meetings and we're actually meeting with, with companies, talking to their leadership team about why the American Heart Association is, is interested in this. Um, bring in your, your HR. A lot of times the human resources department actually in the larger companies will have somebody specifically working on wellness. Um, but even in the smaller companies, the human resources person will certainly understand the business side of this as well. And of course, you know, we, we want to encourage um, people to offer healthier options at work because it's the right thing to do to support your employees being healthier. But of course, from the human resources and the business side of things, you know, we know that um, the health claims increase that, you know, that really affects the company's bottom line. So, so you know, sort of a long-winded way of saying, you know, collect a few champions, you know, uh, Talk to your leadership team, try to get their buy-in, and certainly bring in your partners like the American Heart Association to come in with you and help you make your case. Thank you so much. Great tips and great resources. Um, I'm just looking at the time and realizing we're about to wrap up. So there's just a, another one or two questions that we'll either send out to the group or we'll or send back to the presenters to share with the group, or we'll get people um, responding uh, directly if that's um, more appropriate. So thank you so much to the presenters for those for that Q&A and for your rich presentations. I'm going to hand it back to Christy now just to wrap us up, um, talk about some next steps, and, and close us out. Thanks very much. On to Christy. Thank you, Yona. And again, I want to echo what Yona just said and thank Danelle. Michelle and Kimberly, it was really great to learn more about the culture, creating a culture of health that the American Association has been working on and providing so many tools and resources for doing just that, including access to healthier food in the workplace, as well as an underserved area, particularly those that are lacking healthy food, and then the cooking, the kitchen, and, and how to use those foods. It's just such a, a, a wonderful set of resources that you've shared with us. So thank you very much. Um, I did, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, one of the things we like to do with the webinars are to provide ways for you to continue to engage if you want to learn more, if you want to be connected with any of our speakers and learn more about their programs. You will see on the slide that they there are um, the contact information is provided, as well as um, some information about their programs, including uh, the upcoming Virginia Grocery Investment Fund. There's information on that that Michelle has provided. And you can sign up to um, join the yourthecure.org if you want to get involved locally. We also invite you to uh, learn more about the Chesapeake Food Shed Network by going to our website, chesapeakefoodshed.net. We want to hear from you. Um, if you go there and click on Get Involved, you can tell us um, a little bit more about you and your programs and how the net. we want to hear about how the network can serve you. So please do visit our website and, um, and connect with these great pr presenters. And we will share this information that you see on the slide in our follow-up materials. So if you so you'll have easy access to that in the next day or so. Uh, also, in closing, I want to invite you to join us for our upcoming coffee talks. We have a really great program coming up on May fourth with Cheryl Collin from Community Food Rescue, who's going to be talking about community food food rescue, uh, how to feed more and waste less. And then we also have some network learning opportunity with. Uh, altruistic partners um, who will be talking about enterprising nonprofits and how to accelerate revenue and impact, and that will be in July. 
if you want to host a Coffee Talk with us, please reach out. We are glad to use this platform to help you engage with a broader audience. And we thank you all for coming today and uh, look forward to connecting with you in the future. Have a wonderful day, and again, thank you to our presenters. Hi, everybody who's still on the line. It's Yona. The attendees have all left the coffee talk. Oh, great. Uh,